but it's all about timing, man. EMI. It's all about timing. It's yeah. not about the right about idea. Timing. Yeah. Correct. So I left and I joined Warner Music. And, uh, you know, the first guy to call me up when I started Air Asia was Richard Branson. Wow. He said, hey, I thought it was a stupid idea to start an airline. <laughs> <laughs> Inilah Endgame. Hai teman-teman, hari ini kita kedatangan Tony Fernandez, founder dari Air Asia yang sudah terbang lebih dari 19 tahun terakhir ini dan Air Asia sudah menerbangkan lebih dari 600 juta penumpang selama penerbangan 19 tahun terakhir ini. Dan hari ini kita akan bicara banyak mengenai latar belakangnya Tony dan apa namanya sepak terjang uh, Tony sekarang dan ke depan. Hey Tony, thanks a lot for coming out to our podcast uh, End Game. I know it's busy, but uh, you know it's a real honor to have you on board. Thank you, man. Well, congrats on your new podcast and uh, glad to finally have made it. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I wanna I wanna dig deep uh, a little bit about your you know how you started out. You were born on the 30th of April, 1964, which which makes you a Taurus. And and the last few days we've been interviewing. Coincidentally, people that that are Taurus, uh, do you believe in horoscope? Ah, uh, not really, but um, most people in Asia do, and they seem to like Taurians, uh, <laughs> and they and they like the fact that I was born in the year of the dragon. So uh, I use it where it where it helps. Good, good, good. But, hey, you know, when you read when you read the characteristics of a Taurian or someone who was born in the year of the dragon. There is a lot of similarity to my personality. Uh, which, so, which, is, which is what? Which is uh, never giving up, okay. stubborn, um, <laughs> you know, aggressive, uh, you know, loving people and uh, dreaming, you know, those, those, kind of, those kind of areas. Yeah, yeah. You know, lots of successful people started out with a dream. And, and you started out with a real big dream about, you know, unifying and uniting, you know, ASEAN people. That was really cool. Yeah, I mean, I always, you know, everyone in America and Europe talks about China and India, but they forgot about this amazing region called ASEAN, um, where we have 700 million people, incredible cultural diversity, incredible tourism product, and uh, amazing food. I really think probably it's the best food in the world. If you look at Indonesian and Malaysian and Thai, you know, it's incredible stuff. Um, and so, but no one talked about ASEAN. And I thought, yep. what an incredible market if we could bring it closer together. And uh, that's been my lifelong dream from, you know, I was involved in a basketball league, the ASEAN yep. Basketball League. I've, I've dreamt about uh, an ASEAN Football League, which has got nowhere. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people have talked about an ASEAN World Cup. Um, but what I think I have done a little bit is brought ASEAN closer together through AirAsia. Yeah, that would be awesome if, if we can get an ASEAN World Cup. But uh, did, did you play a lot of soccer when you were a kid? Yeah, I know. Hard for you to believe in my body right now. But, uh, I, I've, I've seen recent photos of you playing soccer, but I'm just curious <laughs> if, if you actually played soccer when you're. I know I did. Kid. It was it was my my passion. Uh, I love football, um, okay. as I call it. Yeah, no, no, I'll call, I'll call it football for your sake. Being, be, being an American, yeah. uh, stroke Indonesian, I um, yeah, I, I, it was my passion from eight years old and. I got a massive cultural shock when I went to my boarding school in England. And I right. thought, wow, these, these posts look a little bit bigger <laughs> than a normal goalpost. <laughs> and uh, my, father, my father never told me that, um, that the school I went to didn't play football. It was rugby. So that was a massive blow to me. But football was my dream. I, I played a very high standard in Malaysia. I played for Malaysian school boys. No kidding. And, uh, wow. Yeah, it was, well, I was very young, under 15 at the time. Okay, probably uh, more but, fit too, but, right? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I never have been incredibly fit guy. Okay. I was very much, uh, you know, I, I used to slack in training. Um, and I was always in a position where, in the days I played anyway, you didn't have to track back as much. So I, I played center forward. 
So wow. I, I, I was a bit of a slacker. I think in today's football, I would have been thrown out a long time ago. <laughs> you, you mean you never wanted to be a striker? I, w I was a striker. I oh, a center striker. Oh, center forward. Yeah. Okay, I got you. I center got you. Forward. Yeah. yeah, I was a center forward and... Uh, you know, but all those dreams came crashing when I was sent to boarding school, which, which are where they only played rugby. Tell, tell, tell me about your experience at a boarding school in, in, in the UK. I know you went there uh, early enough. And yeah, I been... went when I was 13. Okay. I had never been to, I'd never been to England. Okay. Um, and one day my father tells me I'm going to school in England. It seemed an interesting concept. Uh, and then, you know, Lo and behold, I was off to uh, at the airport one day. Uh, at those days, it was a small airport, Subang Airport, which is still in right. existence. And uh, this is before terrorism and all these things. So people could wave to you from the balcony. Uh, half the village came to see me off. I was wearing my school uniform. I felt very cool. I had an unaccompanied miners badge on me. And uh, I had my Samsonite bag full of the standard Malaysian things of Maggie Mee and, uh, you know, Sambal, <laughs> etc. And uh, it felt very cool. The coolness started to wear off when I got on the plane, which was a Qantas Airways. And in okay. those days, to get, must get have, to London. It must have taken forever to get to London. It did take forever, yeah. Stopped in Bangkok, Bahrain, uh, Frankfurt, and then uh, London. And when I arrived in London, it was like, wow, the first thing I thought was, God, everyone's white here. Uh, I've never seen so many white people in my life before. <laughs> and uh, Heathrow in the late 70s, this was 1977, was still a huge airport. Right. Um, and you know, I told my daughter, you have no such problem now, because when you get to England, everyone's Indian. So, <laughs> you, you know, white, white people should probably feel alien when they get to London now. So, uh, and then that, my father was a little bit of a, you know, he thought I was a mummy's boy, which I was. And so he didn't let anyone meet me at the airport. He wanted me to find my own way to Epsom College. So I, you know, I came out of Heathrow Airport, had to find my way to a bus station. Green Line bus, I remember it so well. The, and the uh, bus number was 727, which, which you know, is all about planes, right? 727. Yep. That yep. route was, was a plane, 727. And that took me to Epsom. And I arrived, they dropped me at a pub, which is very appropriate in the last part of my life. Uh, the bus stop was outside a pub, and I got out and I had to walk <laughs> to school from downtown Epsom, right? And my first experience, this girl comes up to me, and she's a skinhead. Uh, <laughs> you know, she's, wear, she's wearing her DM boots, oh and my. she puts her hand in front of me, you know, and, and it has a foster girl. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it has a, just kind of like, she wanted to show me. She had a swastika. Oh, oh my and God. And I didn't know. I thought it was some English greeting. So I went, <laughs> oh, hello. And <laughs> didn't realize that she was a skin and basically telling me. You know, it, it kind of looks like something you would see in some parts of India. Yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I did know what the swastika is, but I didn't realize what she stood for. <laughs> right. I didn't oh, know my that. God. At that, at that point in the UK, the National Front was growing, right? This this uh, would have been in the what the mid seventies or late seventies? Yeah, yeah, late seventies, seventy seven. Oh my god! And so I walked up, I walked up to my school, and I thought, Jesus Christ, what have I done wrong in my life? This looks like a prison camp, you know. I, <laughs> you know, from a nice house in Kuala Lumpur, which you know, we were upper middle class family, it was a real, a real kind of wow, what a shock. <laughs> Uh, you know, we lived in a kind of dormitory, 15 beds, uh, oh, coal showers, uh, being bullied, uh, you know, the whole thing. And it, but anyway, I mean, uh, look, I'm sure we'll talk about it more, but I loved it. And I think it was the making of me. I'm sure but the coal showers the, were, were the ones that inspired you to set up Air Asia back it's, then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, actually, there is, a, there is a story around that later on, I'll tell you. But, um, uh -huh. but yeah, it was a, it was a real baptism of fire. I remember the first, you can imagine this, right? Late 70s, I'm the only brown boy in my house. <laughs> and uh, there were a few day boys there. And then one weekend, they all went off to 
a house, one of someone's house, which the bad guy became my best friend, but he didn't invite me. And I was like, oh, why didn't he invite me? And racism and all these things didn't come into my mind. Later on, I discovered, as we got very close, he didn't invite me because he thought people in Malaysia lived in a tree house and that he thought I wouldn't know how to use Holy my crap. knife and fork. So he didn't want to embarrass me. Um, so <laughs> lots of funny stories, you know, turning up for my first meal in the school cafeteria. I remember my father telling me that I had to eat everything they put in front of me. And I saw the menu on the board and it said toad in the hole. And I thought, oh my God, I feed a frog. <laughs> but it was actually York, Yorkshire pudding in a sausage. Oh my um, God. And, and the first time I got punished was I was late for a lesson. And the master said to me, pull, pull your socks up. So I did. And he thought I was being cheeky, right? <laughs> so, think, yeah. so lots of little stories like that. But, but I, had a, I had a great time at school. How long were you in boarding school? Five years. And, and how, how, years. how often did your parents visit you? Um, or, or they, they made did, you come actually. back to Malaysia to visit? Yeah, I came back to Malaysia. I had my first holiday sort of three months after I arrived in Christmas. And, uh, and then Easter and summer. And then it, it got less and less to like once a year. Wow. Hey, hey your dad was from Goa. I saw. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've been I've been to that place. You know, I used to live in India for three years. Oh, did you? That's that's a real fun place. Yeah, yeah I I yeah, lots of cashew nut wine, lots of hippies, um, <laughs> lots of drugs. I'm sure you didn't do any of that, Gita. No, 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 no. That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but but I want to uh, ask you, who who would have had a better influence or more influence on you, your mom or your dad? I think my mom. But, you know, my dad was a fantastic guy. They were very, very opposite. My father was a doctor. Okay. You know, he was uh, very learned, very conservative. Uh, my mom was a rock and roll rebel. She was a music teacher. Wow. That became a, bu that became a businesswoman. And, and, you know, my father was very left-wing. He didn't believe in uh, private medicine. And my mother was, you know, she'd sell ice to an Eskimo. So, so, you know, it was an amazing childhood because I had such contrasting parents. Was she, was she tough on you? Uh, no, not really. You know, if I was a one-legged footballer, she'd still think I was Pele. Well, my father was completely tough on me. I remember we were playing the Japanese team, Japanese national team, and, you know, we were winning like 6-0 at halftime, and I had scored like five goals, and I thought, today he can't criticize me. Imagine, like, you're 12 years old, right? And he comes up, and I think, oh, he's going to say, well done to me. And he says, God, you're a real hog. You haven't passed the ball once to your teammates. <laughs> <laughs> it was, like, devastating oh to me. And I was captain of the team. But that That's was just tough. my dad. That's you know, tough. He just, he's got to be tough yeah, he on went you. To board, he, he went to boarding school when he was five, right? Oh, so my God. So he was tough on me. My mom was quite the opposite. So it was a nice balance. Okay. But I say that my – I mean, both parents had an enormous impact on my life as I think most people will say. Yep. Um, my father obviously gave me a lot of my political views. Um, and my mother very much gave me the belief of motivation and, and the power of people and the power of belief that you can do anything. You yeah. know, she was never afraid to take on a challenge. And you know, she wasn't educated uh, at, a, at the highest level, but she would never be afraid of, of taking on a challenge. And, and that left a very indelible mark on me. My mom passed away when I was quite young. Mm, was sorry quite to a, hear that. Quite a, yeah, quite a, quite a tough time for me when she did because you never believe it's going to happen. I was in boarding school. I was 15. You know, I had become in love with rugby and I was playing hockey uh, and cricket. And, you know, when she, I was okay. I was, a, I was a competent sportsman. But after she passed away, I suddenly became this amazing hockey player and, you know, and, Wow. Suddenly, so much faster. Mm. Uh, but it was it really affected me when she and coming back to Malaysia for the first time after she had gone. You know, she was the, the life and soul of the house, and it became very tough. But you know, uh, my whole life has been up and down with uh, travesty and disasters, and you know, I'm living through one right now in, in COVID. But wow. uh, there's always a, there's always a silver lining, and there's yeah, I've always taken the view that. You know, can't cry about it. 
just got to go out there and fix it and be positive and there will always be something out there. Right. We'll, we'll all pull through, you know, every, you're not, you're not unique. You know, everybody's going through a tough time. And, yeah. And look, I, I, you, you strike me as more of a right winger, but your dad was a left winger. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm right dead center. Um, you okay. know, I think if there's a, if there's a definition of a caring capitalist, then, you know, I believe in the capitalist system. I yep. believe in rewards, but I, I believe that education health um should be available to everyone yeah um, i agree and but, and that you know these are these are basic human rights yeah now i'm not saying you don't you shouldn't if someone wants to go to a private school and they can afford it go ahead sure if someone wants to go to a private hospital and can afford it go ahead because that takes the burden off the state system but it shouldn't be that the private system is so much better than the state system um, I think Sweden's got it kind of right. So I yep. don't believe in high taxation. I think there are better ways of doing it. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, you know, I think capitalism is the only way. Um, Left-wing systems have shown to not get the desired results. Right. Um, uh, that everything, you know, education system under the Labour government, everything went down. The comprehensive system went down. Yeah. The grammar school system was destroyed. Uh, but then again, the grammar school was also a little bit elitist. So there's a balance somewhere along the line. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I believe in market policies, but I believe there should be wealth redistribution. Isn't it kind of a mockery that, you know, education used to be a nonprofit good. Now it becomes so much of a luxury good, right? For yeah. most, yeah. I mean, not just for yeah. some. Yeah. I and mean, even the private schools before used to be, the money went back into the school. Correct. Right. It wasn't, yeah. it, it wasn't dividends and private companies running them and stuff. So I find that a bit weird, but that's the free market. I suppose you can't have, yeah. you can't need, but, but the state should not run away from their obligations. Sure. I believe you. Because the, I, I'm the with biggest you. asset in the country is the people. Yep. And uh, I think, you know, we've been very successful in Air Asia because we flattened the socioeconomic scene. I, I've said that I don't care where you came from, yeah. whether you came from Oxbridge or Harvard, uh, or you left school at 13, everyone is level with me. Yeah. And if you have a brain, but you weren't able to fully use it because you didn't have the right economic uh, incentives to go to a private school or to go to university yeah. because you had to feed your parents, at Eurasia will level that. And so we have boys and girls who, who joined us to carry bags or mm. check-in assistants or pilots now. We have telephone operators who are CEOs. Um, and that is, if there's one thing that I leave, I, I, I've left a culture that people believe in AirAsia, they can do anything they want to do. And that is my single biggest success factor. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Hey, uh, let's, let's go back to your early scholastic days. You, you went on to London School of Economics. You studied and got out with an accounting degree. Who, who convinced you to study accounting? Yeah, I had no choice, actually. I, <laughs> I, I did very badly. It's amazing you said scholastic. Uh, <laughs> I, I see you as a typical uh, scholastic person. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. You know, well, I... At, at college, I didn't join the Malaysian Singapore Society, right? I was like, hey, I'm going to live with you guys for the rest of your lives. I want to meet other people. Because um, all they ever did was hang around with each other and go to Tramp Nightclub. And, uh, I'm with you. And go to, yeah. And, yeah. And, go, and go to Leicester Square. I saw the same damn thing, man, when I was in the US. Yeah. I, I try yeah. to be outside that community. Yeah. Once in a so while. I, I was outside, but I, I unfortunately enjoyed college life too much. And, uh, you know, I always said to my dad, he didn't quite share the same view as me, uh, but <laughs> you, college and university is about living and experiencing and meeting people and finding what life's all about. And I don't care whether I get a first or a third or, or just barely scrape through, which I barely scrape through, by the way. And, uh, you know, I'll, it's a degree. It, um, it doesn't mean I'm any smarter or dumber, but I said, I want to be street smart. I want to learn about business. I want to learn about people. I want to you know, learn all that. So I had a lot of fun in university, but I learned a lot as well. And then when I did so badly, 
uh, my father said, either you do accountancy or you come back. So I thought, okay, do accountancy. And I hated it. It was the worst time in my life. Um, but I, but I passed everything first time because I just hated it well so done. much. And you know, Gita, you can, you can pass accounting exams and you don't actually understand accountancy. So my first job, I didn't know how <laughs> Tell to me do about it or a credit. I was calling my girlfriend saying, Hey, where do you put the debit? And where would you put the credit? <laughs> right? Uh, and I passed everything. <laughs> so let's say something about accounting exams, but it's like driving. Did Some, you take the chartered tickets. accountant? Uh, uh, certified. Certified. Okay. Chartered certified. Okay. Yeah. So that was kind of one level below in England anyway. Well, chartered was seen <laughs> as the as the division one. The elite. So, okay. Yeah. They, they gave me one actually about seven years ago. Just an honorary. All I had to do was fill up That's some That's pretty forms. damn good. Yeah, I know. So I became a chartered accountant <laughs> uh, without taking the exams. Um, no, if if you, you had you, wanted to, if you had wanted to study political science, would your parents have let you? No, I okay. wanted to. Well, yeah. okay. how do you know that? I would have loved to have done political science. I would have, if I got into a super duper Oxford University or something, which I had zero chance of getting to. And the only, and I said it was political science. I'm sure my father would have said okay, but um, no, I I've always loved. It's funny you ask that question. You would have no done well, man. Me. I read you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved, uh, I would have loved to study political science. Yeah. I'd love to be a politician, to be honest. Hey, I, I can you. see that as your end game in a big way. <laughs> I can see Ooh, you I'm running sure. a big country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Better, better stop that subject right now. <laughs> <laughs> we can cut that out if you want. <laughs> yeah. But uh, okay, then, then you got out, then you worked. In, in the music industry, right? As an auditor, Virgin Atlantic. Yeah, well, I started or... in, as an accountant in, a, in an accounting firm for about three months. Okay. Months. It was an, as an auditor, it was, it was mind blowing. It was um, really mind blowing, you know. Yeah. Uh, the toughest, toughest part of that job was filling up. You had to fill up every 15 minutes of your, of your timesheet. And when you're doing nothing, it was really tough. So a lot of clients got charged for for nothing really and you know I used to be listening to cricket I used to bunk off and watch the test match and uh, I thought this is not for me and I've always been that kind of person I can't do something I don't enjoy right. so I wrote to every record company they all told me to go to hell except one which was Virgin and which is uh, a hell of a company went, at that went, time still is yeah I, I went I went to the interview and um they rejected me as well. And I was walking out of the interview and Richard Branson was walking in. And I thought, okay, do I be a shy Malaysian and just- No kidding, oh my God. Or do, or, or do I grab this chance, right? So I said something about Borneo or orangutans or something. And he started talking to me in the doorway and he said, hey, you sound really interesting. Let's have a cup of coffee. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, step one accomplished. I've got his attention. Wow. And so we sat down talking about Malaysia and music. And then he said to me, why are you here, by the way? And I said, oh, I came for a job interview and you rejected me. He said, look, there's something really special about you. So I'm going to reverse that. So he got me a job, not in Virgin Music, but in Virgin Television, which was, uh, he, he had started something called... Um, uh, music box which was actually he was ahead of his time mm. it was a precursor to MTV okay. and he had a satellite TV channel but you had to have a satellite you know as big as your house um, and you've got a pretty big house so that was also you know again he was way ahead of his time and then we did post-production so uh, we used to do music videos and so he hired me as a financial accountant you know, when I joined Virgin, and this is no exaggeration, the cash book had marijuana in it. Um, <laughs> the balance sheet didn't balance. And, and uh, I was like, whoa. Well, at least you but figured hey, out where I the debit learn. was going, right? And the credit was yeah, going where. I, I, and I, I fixed it up, actually. I fixed it up. I oh, cleaned up the suspense account. And, and Branson grew to like me. And 
you know, they moved me into a small little. But you must have been a few levels below Branson, right? You reported directly to him, or I, I, I was like, I was like a hundred levels below him. But he just liked me and thought there was something about me, so he, he kept an eye on me. And then he promoted me to um, a company called Six Two Five, which was a post-production company, and he made me financial controller. I was like twenty-four, and I was financial controller, and you know. I don't know, you are my age, so, or kind of my age. So, you know, there was, you know, this was the height of music videos, right? Right. So, 625 was like one of the, one of the top companies. So, I was doing videos. Well, I wasn't doing it, but I was in the company when Godly and Cream were in doing Sledgehammer, uh, you know, uh, all these amazing videos, Michael Jackson's yep. video, et cetera. Yeah. So, I was doing that. I was financial control. I was kind of everything. I used to kind of, put my head in on the creative side, wow. you know, I'd, I'd contribute to Godly and Cream Sledgehammer video. Wow. Um, and it was an amazing experience. And what about the thriller, key, Michael Jackson? No, nah, we, we, that wasn't this. That, was that would have been a blast. Branson sister company. Yeah. Called 525. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in that. Okay. Um, and then, um, and then, you know, my other, my job part time used to be, you know, Godly and Cream and, all these big video directors would say, Tony, I need inspiration, which meant go and buy me some marijuana. And, <laughs> and, and so we were in Tottenham Court Road. I'm, I'm going to be in trouble, man, with this interview. <laughs> <laughs> take the train from Tottenham Court Road to Notting Hill, knock on the door, and some big dude would come out, do the transaction, and go back. Um, so, yeah, it was a very colorful experience at Virgin. I had, right. I had a great time. And one day, Richard Branson calls me up and says, hey, I'm going to start an airline. Do you want to come and join me in that? I said, you're mad. You can't start an airline. <laughs> right? Uh, so I said, I'm out of here, man, because you're going to have to sell Virgin and all of us are going to be bloody sad oh my by God. whoever bought it. And I was right. He sold a lot of Virgin. Yeah. He sold Virgin Music to EMI. Yeah. But where I was wrong is that EMI people. But it's all about timing, man. EMI. It's all about timing. It's yeah. not about the right about idea. Timing. Yeah. Correct. So I left and I joined Warner Music. And, uh, you know, the first guy to call me up when I started Air Asia was Richard Branson. Wow. He said, hey, I thought it was a stupid idea to start an airline. <laughs> <laughs> Inilah Endgame. The episode Endgame berikutnya. You're the complete manifestation of guts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, that's, that's, I what we got, that's what you got to tell the Asian boys and girls. It's all about yeah. guts, man. So I, so I you know, I um, didn't ask my salary. I didn't ask anything. And then in a month's time, I was on a plane back to Malaysia. And the Malaysian company were like, who is this young asshole coming back, right? They were like organizing <laughs> a boycott of me. They were like, who is this 27-year-old kid from London who's going to be our boss? <laughs> 